As mentioned, my name is Brandon Dale, and I'm a front-end engineer at Facebook. And the title of my talk today is Algebraic Effects, Fibers, Coroutines, Oh My. But to you, that probably sounds a little bit more like, wait, what, that's not even a word? Can I go home yet? Please, someone make him stop. So the goal of today's talk is to shed some light on a few of the more important academic concepts that are relevant to the recent work that the React team has been doing. And all of the things that we discussed today aren't new or novel with React. They're ideas that already exist in other parts of the programming or computer science community. And these ideas have influenced the direction of React's development. Now, the adaptation of these ideas in the context of UI library is itself potentially novel and at the very least interesting. So I know that academic com computer science probably has a pretty frightening reputation for some of you, so I want to follow React's lead here and just give you a helpful warning up front for this talk. So warning that this is just for fun. You don't need to actually know any of this to use React. So nothing that I'm going to talk about today is actually mission critical for using React. The concepts that we'll cover today are all mostly internal and just of sort of academic interest, and they're totally opaque to you as product developers. So like knowing what an algebraic effect is, it's not gonna help you like write a modal component or anything, it's just for fun. But understanding these ideas will hopefully give you a better idea of what React actually is under the hood and help you build a more accurate, nuanced mental model of how it works. So all of these things are related to this topic, this thing called React Fiber, but what exactly is React Fiber? So React Fiber is just a code name given to a recent effort to rewrite React from the ground up while maintaining full backwards compatibility. Uh, if you're using React 16, which I hope all of you are, then you're already using Fiber. Uh, it's been in production for over a year, and most people didn't even realize it. And that always reminds me of this quote from uh, Futurama. When you do things right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all. <laughs> so I think that applies pretty well to that. And plus, how often do you get a quote something called God Entity? Like it's, all right. So let's, let's try to understand some of the motivations behind React Fiber, because rewriting like mission-critical infrastructure is usually a pretty hard sell to management. So there must be some significant advantage that Fiber provides over the previous implementation of React. And while there are a handful of really good reasons, the one that I'm going to focus on today is something called async rendering. Now, at this point, async rendering is maybe starting to feel a little buzzwordy to you but really it's just a general term that refers primarily to two concrete features that React Fiber enables, time slicing and suspense. Now I wanna preface this by saying that both of these features may involve some new or updated APIs, but I'm not gonna to talk too much about that. We're more interested in the idea than the implementation. Uh, if you wanna know more about how these features might look from your end, I highly recommend Dan Abramoff's talk, Beyond React 16, which you can find on the official React blog. Okay, so other than the fact that both of these names are really cool, what do we know about them? So let's start off with time slicing. A quick crash course on web browsers. We know that browsers are responsible for things like executing all our code, laying out the page, calculating styles, and we usually wanna do all of that at about 60 frames per second to keep the app smooth. And if we do the math, that means that we have about 16.67 milliseconds of time for each individual frame. Uh, if the browser has to do more than roughly 16 milliseconds of work at a time, we get what we call jank, where things start stuttering or lagging, and this is a really bad user experience. So time slicing is a way, that, uh, is a way to take all of that work that React has to do and split it up into chunks that can be done within that 16 millisecond time frame. And this lets React keep the application responsive where it matters. Not only can React use time slicing to split up, split up expensive work over multiple frames, it can also reprioritize different updates so that the page stays interactive. For example, imagine a page with a long filtered list of items where the list updates every time you type into this text input. Now, if rendering that list is really expensive, it might hurt the user experience by causing that text input to lag or stutter while React is re-rendering that list. With time slicing, all of that work is split into those smaller chunks, so React can identify that updating a text input should happen immediately and ensure that it happens before it does the more expensive work. So that's the gist of time slicing. Next, let's look at suspense. 
So suspense is a little harder to explain because it's a more generic feature that solves a potentially larger set of problems. At its core, you can think of suspense as a generic way for any component in, in your application to pause or suspend rendering if it requires some asynchronous data to render. So this could be anything at all, like an API response, maybe an asset like an image, or even another component if you're doing code splitting. And when a component suspends, it's essentially telling React, hey, I know you're trying to render, but I have to go grab some data really quick. Would you mind putting things on hold while I do that? Now, of course, that's a simplification, but hopefully it demonstrates the one aspect of suspense that we want to focus on, which is that it involves interrupting React when it's rendering and then asynchronously resuming that render at some point in the future. So if we look at time slicing and we look at suspense, we can identify a common requirement for both of these features that we'd call async rendering. And that requirement is interrupting. React needs to be able to interrupt what it's doing and then resume it later on. So whether it's to interrupt a render to you know, spread some work over multiple frames to hit that 60 frames per second target, or interrupting it to wait for some asynchronous data with suspense, being able to pause rendering and resume it later on is a critical requirement for async rendering. So we know what we need to make async work, but what exactly, but why exactly do we need fiber for this? Couldn't we have just maybe added a few more lines of code to the old version of React and, and called it a day? Unfortunately, the answer is no, and to understand why the answer is no, let's refocus a little bit and just talk about JavaScript for a second. And I want to talk about how JavaScript manages the work that it's responsible for doing. So let's just quickly define work, because it might not be obvious what I mean by that. So with React, the work it has to do is things like creating DOM nodes or calling render or your other lifecycle methods, everything that's the responsibility of the React library. Now with JavaScript, I'm defining it the same as the stuff that the JavaScript runtime is responsible for, you know, creating variables, updating your arrays, handling control flow. All that stuff, all your code, basically. Now, in React, we can think of a component as a unit of work, right? It's an abstraction that defines some set of work that React has to do. In JavaScript, we can define functions as a unit of work because it's a function that contains some set of code that the runtime needs to execute. So how does JavaScript manage that work? How does it keep track of what it needs to do? Like most programming languages, JavaScript uses something called a call stack. And the call stack is this stack-like data structure, like you know, a stack of plates. And it's used to track what function is being executed at any given point in the program. So when a function is called, it creates something called the stack frame, which you can think of as this like internal object that represents that particular function call. And the stack frame usually stores information like the parameters the function was called with, some local variables that are declared inside the function, and other metadata about the function. As a program executes and functions call other functions, the call stack grows, right? Once one function is done executing, its stack frame gets removed uh, from that stack, and then execution continues from its return address, which is usually the previous stack frame in the stack, which points to like the function that called that function. Since this is kind of a critical concept for understanding React Fiber, let's just walk through an example. All right, so we have a, some really great code that I wrote here um, for doubling a number and printing it. We go function add, double, print double, and that's basically it. So let's like walk through it and see what happens to the call stack as we execute the code. So the first thing that happens, parses the code, it finds the first function call, which is this print double. So a, a stack frame for that function call is created, pushed onto the stack. We go into that function, we see, oh, it calls another function double, we create a stack frame, gets pushed onto the stack. Double then again calls another function add, which creates a stack frame and pushes it to the stack. We hit add and there's no more function calls, it's returning. So that stack frame for add gets removed from the stack and we go to the return address, which would be this double function. So then we're back to double and this again just returns, no more function calls, so that stack frame gets removed. And then inside print double, we do another function call with this console.log, so that gets added to the stack. And then once that's done, it gets removed, and then we hit the end of print double, so that stack frame also gets removed, and we end up with an empty call stack, so the program's done executing. Right. So let's look a little closer at those stack frames that we were just kind of pushing on. What do, what do they maybe look like? So this is a simplified view of what a stack frame might look like. 
Like we said, it just stores some basic information about the function it represents and some frame-specific data, like its parameters and information about the values and the, the local variables. Now, here I've represented this stack frame as this JavaScript object, but it's actually important to note that stack frames aren't things that you can access or use in JavaScript, right? They're completely internal representations in the JavaScript engine itself. And they're created and managed implicitly as our program executes. So there's no way for us as you know, a JavaScript program to access or use these stack frames explicitly. So, well, why does that matter? Why do we care about call stacks or stack frames when we're really trying to understand async rendering in React? Well, the reason it's relevant is because this model is actually problematic and in tension with the goals of async rendering. So with async rendering, we know that we need to be able to quickly interrupt what we're doing, and if we're relying on the call stack to track all of our program state, then we don't really have the ability to just stop doing some work on demand. You know, if we're nearing the end of our frame deadline, and the call stack still has a bunch of stack frames in it, we have to just wait for all of those function calls to finish before the browser can do anything else, like updating the page layout or style. And since we can't access the call stack or stack frames in JavaScript, there's not much that we can do about that uh, unless we look for alternative models. And this is exactly what React Fiber is. React Fiber is essentially a React call stack. It's a React-specific implementation of a call stack-like model where React has full control over scheduling what work should be done. And you can think of a fiber, concrete thing that is a fiber, as a stack frame for a React component. Running out of water here. Uh, just like how a stack frame represents a specific instance of a function call, and it stores information like its parameters, return address, local variables, a fiber represents the same thing but for, fiber, or for React components. Instead of parameters, we have props. Instead of local variables, we have state. And instead of a return address, we have like the parent component. And this is a simplification, of course, but in reality, it's not that much more complex. So here's code that I actually took directly from the React source. Uh, this is exactly how React models a fiber internally. There's this fiber node constructor function, which is kind of like a class, and we can see that it just sets some basic fields that store data about the component instance. Things like its type, its return or parent, props, state, key. So, there's a lot of fields that I've excluded here, but this is the basic idea. A fiber is just this simple representation of that instance, much like a stack frame represents a function call. And unlike stack frames, fibers are just regular JavaScript objects. React can actually create, manage, or delete them whenever or wherever it sees fit. And now, it would be kind of silly if fiber was just like a one-to-one -one re implementation of the call stack. But you might have noticed that the fiber node constructor here not only stores like a reference to the parent, but it also has a child and sibling. And this is in contrast with stack frames, which we know, right, they only have that return address. They can only go to the function that called them when they're done. And this is a small but powerful detail that actually makes fibers much more useful. So here's some schedule love for you, scheduler love. Um, <laughs> Sean set me up really well, really appreciate it. Uh, so React has this internal scheduling module that can implement much more complex, complex React-specific patterns that the native call stack wouldn't be able to represent. And so this scheduler is responsible for knowing which fiber is being worked on at any given point, which one should be worked on next, and if execution needs to be interrupted, it's responsible for making sure that the work that it was doing gets resumed correctly afterwards. And since a fiber stores more information, like its child or sibling, the scheduler can make more intelligent and complex decisions around what work should be done when. And unlike stack frames, fibers can also keep around local data like state, even if they're not currently active. Right, with a stack frame, when it's popped off of the stack, all of the local information that was stored in it is gone. But that's not the case with a fiber. So if React gets interrupted during an async render, it can resume rendering with that fiber with minimal overhead. All, almost all of the work that it did can be preserved, making interrupting and resuming a relatively cheap process. And unlike the call stack, when the scheduler finishes rendering a fiber, it can actually start from potentially any other fiber, right? So with the call stack, it always can turns from return, continues from the return address. So there's one place it can go, but React scheduler can more intelligently prioritize other updates that might have occurred in other parts of the application. So that's the basic idea of what a fiber is in React. Now, our goal here is to talk about like what are they in like terms of computer science. So 
what exactly are fibers? Like, are they a new thing? Uh, no, they're not. React didn't invent fiber. There's something that has already existed and that React has integrated from other communities. So let's get to some academic descriptions of it. So a fiber is just a generic way to model program execution in a way where each individual unit of work, in our case components, works together cooperatively. And you can think of fibers as something in the same category as threads or processes, if that helps. But all you have to know is that a fiber is all about modeling some kind of program execution in a cooperative way. And this hopefully makes sense if we think about how we just described fibers in React. React can switch between fibers as much as it needs to because they're cooperative. No single fiber attempts to dominate the program. Now fibers are actually used in a couple other totally different high priority systems. For example, Microsoft Windows uses fibers in some places. Uh, and the OCaml programming language has been using them as the basis for its concurrency model. Now, the fibers in React are not exact one-to-one -one, you know, comparisons. They're a little bit different, but the core idea is consistent. Now, coroutine is another term that I mentioned in the title, and thankfully, it's pretty easy to define now. A, co a coroutine describes the same basic idea that we laid out for fibers. Coroutines and fibers both refer to this cooperative execution model. So a simple definition is coroutines and fibers are mostly the same thing. Now, even in academic computer science, the distinction between fibers and coroutines is blurry at best. If anything, it might be that fibers are usually described in these low-level program execution terms, while coroutines are typically something you see as like a language feature, like, like a function. But in the context of React, that distinction doesn't really matter, so we don't lose much by simplifying it. All right, so we know what fibers are, and we know what they represent, but what else can we do with them? We know that they allow React to directly control program state and execution, which enables features like time slicing and suspense. But that's not the only thing that fibers enable for React. Because React now has this low-level control, it can implement more advanced patterns that wouldn't be possible when relying on just the native call stack. And one of those patterns is something called algebraic effects. Ooh, scary sounding. <laughs> <laughs> so algebraic effects are an active area of research in academia, and they don't really exist yet in many production-level languages. They definitely don't exist in JavaScript, which makes it a little hard to describe them in this context. But luckily, we do have something relatively close that can give us a general idea of what they are. And that thing is error handling. So we're going to talk about JavaScript again, and let's talk about how we manage errors in JavaScript. Hopefully most of this will already be pretty familiar. So in JavaScript, error handling has two parts, right? You trigger an error and then you handle that error. So to trigger an error, you use the throw keyword. You don't have to import it, it's always in scope, it's this global feature that you can use at any time to indicate that some kind of exception has occurred. Now throw doesn't actually dictate what your program should do as a result of that error, right? All throw does is signal that an exception has occurred, but it doesn't tell you what should happen as a result of that. And that's where catch comes in, right? So catch as part of a try catch block defines the program behavior for when an error occurs. So the resulting behavior of that thrown error is defined by what any potential catch block surrounding it might do. Which means that the same error thrown in different parts of your program might result in different behavior. And that's the insight that I want to drive home here. The act of throwing and the resulting behavior are totally independent. And if we think about it, this pattern is actually really nice. All the complexity of error handling is isolated to these catch blocks, and we only need one API, throw, for all possible kinds of errors in our program. Plus, it doesn't matter how deeply nested throw is in relation to the nearest catch block, right? It doesn't, it could be 100 levels nested, it could be one. It will just totally bypass that call stack and work. So that means that any module, including third-party ones that you install from NPM, can throw errors and not have to worry about the specific details of how those errors affect program execution. So let's try to run with this pattern a little bit and see how it works with other problems. How about logging? Logging is a pretty common problem, so let's look at that. Uh, we all probably have our own abstractions and interfaces for logging in our programs. And third-party packages that require it, you know, there's probably some API config that you have to do, and maybe you have a bunch of packages that have different APIs. It gets a little hairy. So what if we took this same pattern uh, that error handling uses and applied it here? 
what if instead of having to manually import or configure logging, there was a keyword called log just that worked just like throw? And like catch, we had something like handle log. Not as good as catch, but couldn't think of anything better. That could catch or handle that log event and control exactly what kind of behavior occurred, what kind of logging happened. Now, just like with error handling, any code could signal that a log event should occur and then leave it up to the surrounding context to determine what exactly should happen. And unlike errors, what if the program could keep executing after that log event was created? Like after a function call finishes, right? So no importing, no configuring, it just works for everyone everywhere. That would be pretty great, right? Well, let's keep it up. What about for another problem, handling network requests? What if we had a fetch keyword that allowed us to signal that a network request should occur, and then a handle fetch block that defined exactly what happened when that fetch was triggered? The fetch keyword itself doesn't actually create the network request, it just signals that a request should be made, just like throw signals that an exception occurred. And maybe that handle fetch block could actually asynchronously return data back to the code that triggered the fetch. So not only does it keep executing after the fetch event, it actually reads data provided it to it from that handle fetch block. And maybe that fetch block, or that uh, handle fetch block could even cache the data, and if it already had it, it could synchronously return it. That'd be pretty great. So hopefully these demonstrate a consistent pattern that we could apply to many different problems. And this is the pattern called algebraic effects. The name really is much more complicated than the idea, and all of the examples that we just discussed demonstrate the core concept of algebraic effects. Uh, they are composed of two main parts, we have effects and effect handlers. And effects just signal to the surrounding environment that some kind of event or effect has occurred and needs to be handled. So this is like the throw signaling that an error has occurred. And then we have effect handlers, which allow you to run code in response to these effects and eventually even potentially return some value. So in the case of try catch, we can't actually return a value from catch or even keep executing the code that follows the throw statement, but with actual algebraic effects, that model that you would be able to do that, like we saw in our hypothetical fetch example. And with algebraic effects, that effect handler maybe could even potentially be synchronous or asynchronous, or maybe sometimes it is synchronous and sometimes it's not, which is a really powerful detail, which means that languages that have algebraic effects don't actually need things like iterators or async await because those can all be built on top of effects. So it's like a more low-level control flow abstraction. And like throw catch, effects can also be nested at any level in relation to the effect handler. Just like you can throw 100 levels deep and it will still find the nearest catch. That's the same idea for effects and effects handlers. So that's really the core idea of algebraic effects. They allow us to model effectual behavior like errors, logging, network requests in a way where the effect and its behavior are independent. So, how does this tie back to React? We know that fibers allow React to implement more complex patterns like algebraic effects, even though they don't actually exist in JavaScript. So in this case, in what way has React implemented algebraic effects? How is it relevant? It's relevant because we can think of React suspense, or just suspense, in terms of algebraic effects. And to recap, because maybe we don't all know what suspense is, it's just that way for React components to signal to React that it doesn't have some of the async data that it needs, and then allow React to potentially pause what it's doing and wait for that data before it continues rendering. Now let's try to ground this in a real world example, because it'll be as easier to understand how this relates to algebraic effects if we know exactly what it looks like. Big old block of code, here we go. So a standard warning, this is an experimental API, and it's definitely maybe not gonna represent what it looks like when Suspense is officially released. I haven't shown any of the import statements, so we're just gonna assume that we have these functions. Don't worry about what they're called. Don't get too caught up on the specifics of the API. We just wanna use it to demonstrate this idea. So here we have a very small example of using Suspense to render some async data. Specifically, we have a user component that fetches some data for a user and then renders an H3, data, uh, H3 tag with its, the user's name. So here are a couple functions, create cache, create resource, which we can just assume come from some unknown data caching library that works with React Suspense. Don't worry about where they come from, just assume they exist. So we create a cache, and then we also create something called a resource. And we can think of a resource as this concrete interface for how our components will fetch data in a way that is compatible with suspense. 
So we pass it this fetch user function, which we also never imported, but we'll just assume that it makes some API request to fetch a user and then returns like a promise that resolves with the data. And this is the most important part here. When this user component renders, we call this read method on the user resource. We pass it in the cache and the ID for the user that we want to fetch, and then we just assume that the result is returned synchronously. And this read method is the most important part of the example. When calling read, user resource will check if that cache that we provided has that user data for the ID that we passed in. And if it does, then great. It just returns that data synchronously and the component can continue rendering as usual. And if it doesn't have that data, then this is when it would trigger that suspend effect to let React know that it should try and wait for the data. Now, React might listen and wait, or if it thinks it needs to render this component quickly, then it might just go ahead and render any fallback that you have to provide. So this user resource interface just signals to React that a suspend event has occurred, and, that it's up, and then it's up to React to decide what the behavior of the app should be at that point. And hopefully that behavior sounds a little familiar. You can think of suspense as an algebraic effect. What this, when this read function doesn't have the data that it needs, it signals to React that it should suspend rendering and wait for it you know, to resolve. We can think of this as a React-specific suspend effect, and React itself acts as the effect handler, deciding what it should do based on the information that it's received. And just like other algebraic effects, this suspend effect is contextual. So if you render the same component in two different parts of your application, then the behavior of suspending might differ depending on how React's scheduler has prioritized things. But before we got started talking about algebraic eff uh, effects, we noted that they don't exist in JavaScript. So how does React implement this? Let's take another little peek behind the curtain and try to figure that out. So this is code that I took directly from that unnamed caching library we were using. It exists, but I was asked not to mention what it is. So uh, this is a snippet from the source of the read method that we called in the user component, right? That really important method. And I've excluded a bunch of stuff for brevity's sake, but we can see here that we have this switch statement that checks the status of some record. And we can assume that this is like the cache record for the data that we're trying to read. And you'll notice that in two scenarios, empty or pending, React, React actually ends up throwing something called suspender. And suspender isn't an error. Uh, this is actually how React manages to implement suspense. When a component needs to suspend, this method throws a promise which represents that async data that the component needs to wait for. When it throws, render just stops, right? Because as we mentioned, it just kind of like stops execution until the nearest call, uh, catch block. But if we're throwing when we're rendering and the program just so totally stops as a result, then how does the component ever get rendered, right? Wouldn't throwing cause all of that work that React did to be lost? Thanks to Fibers, the answer is no. We said that Fibers enable React to implement algebraic effects like this, and the reason for that is because this technique of using throw to fake algebraic effects isn't problematic for React because it relies on Fibers, not the native call stack, to track program execution. So when that throw occurs and rendering gets interrupted, React can resume again with minimal overhead because it's using fibers to track the program state. It might even render and throw again a handful of times while that promise is being resolved, but eventually it will probably resolve and the component can render without suspending. Okay, so we covered a lot of ground today and a lot of that ground was pretty rough terrain, so let's just summarize what we learned here. Uh, React Fiber was an effort by the React team to rewrite React in a way that provided React more low-level control over program execution. They accomplished this by using this existing idea from computer science called a fiber, which is a model of execution based on cooperation, which works really well with React's component model. By relying on fibers, React was able to implement an API modeled after algebraic effects, which is a generic and useful way to model effectual behavior with effects and effect handlers. I know that a lot, that's a lot to take in, but hopefully this sheds some light on what exactly React Fiber is, why it was useful, and helps you understand uh, exactly how React is modeled internally. Uh, and that's my talk. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and thanks to React for having me.